in that collective wealth. So a basic income could be seen as a sort of social dividend of the contribution of our society, Sweden, made over those centuries. I think that argument is so fundamental that we really must find ways of articulating it and doing so. And the second thing is that you can argue on justice, philosophical justice points of view, why a basic income is the only form of social protection which satisfies the following justice principles. The first justice principle is what I call the security difference principle following John Rawls' theory of justice. And essentially it goes that a policy is only socially just if it improves the security of the most insecure groups in society. If it doesn't improve the security of the most insecure, then it has a problem because it's not socially just. A basic income does that. It means that everybody receives a basic income. It is a universal cash payment, unconditional, that you receive as a legal resident, whether you're a man, woman, child, whether you're able-bodied, disabled body, whatever you want to call it, whether you all receive. So it is a universal base. And obviously it is worth more for the person who's insecure and low income than it is for the actual. You're going to pay for it, that's another issue we can discuss. That. The second thing is that any social policy should satisfy the paternalism test principle. And I say this to my Swedish social democrats with increasing emphasis. Because what this means is that a social policy is only just if it does not impose controls on some groups in society that are not imposed on the most free groups, right? So something like workfare fails this test. Something like that says you can have some modest bit of charity from the state if you do as I tell you. That is paternalism. I know what's best for you. Paternalism test principle poses a big problem for social democrats because they want to do good and they want to be appreciated in raising people. Not just social democrats, but the, the tendency of the moralistic center. I see it in big time in the current coalition government in Britain, where they push this argument to the extreme, to the point of total ridiculous nonsense. But the paternalism test principle is not respected. And nor is the third social justice principle, which is what I call the rights, not charity principle. It's related to the paternalism test, but it's different. A social policy is only just it if it improves the rights of the recipients while restricting the discretionary power of the people dealing with the system. A system, a policy, which increases the discretionary power of bureaucracies over the citizen or the individual or the denizens who are denied rights is basically unjustifiable in ethical terms. And yet, this is precisely what has been happening all over Europe and across the world. And the next principle is the dignified work. A social policy is only just if it enables people to pursue a dignifying work life. A policy which is telling people that you can only have a little something if you do labor that you would never dream of doing is hardly satisfying that principle. But a policy which is also saying you must accept low wages and you must accept these unpalatable jobs, is also one that doesn't respect this principle. And telling people who are in the precariat that they should accept 
a job working in a sewer or working in an unattractive, dangerous environment for a very low pay is not something that any good society should be satisfied with. That is fundamental. And the final justice principle, which I think is essential for a green left sort of politics, is the ecological constraint principle. No social policy is just if it threatens the environment and the reproductive capabilities of our communities and our society. If it allows laborist principles to triumph over the preservation and reproduction of our society. An example I give is a classic case in Spain where both the mainstream parties agreed that a wonderful part of Spain, Spanish coast could be converted into property development, re reducing the space for the species of birds and fish and wildlife in that whole area in order to create some short-term jobs that would end at the end of the construction period and would then usher in a consumerist, high-income tourist sector for a tiny minority. So they agreed, because of this, they've done it, and the construction companies have enriched themselves, and a wonderful part of Spain no longer, no longer exists. We are seeing that commercial principle triumphing over the ecological constraint principle far too often for comfort. Now, a basic income would not solve all these problems, but it satisfies the social justice principle. And it also has instrumental advantages. We've just been doing basic income pilots in India. And the book on the results are coming out, is coming out later this year. And we've seen the results in those communities which were actually not very conducive to a successful experiment with basic income. But one of the things, one of the many things that have come out of this pilot and have come out of pilots we've done in Africa and we've seen in, in Brazil and elsewhere, is that people who have basic security, unlike the middle class bikes, don't become lazy. They don't go and sit around and do nothing because they suddenly have basic security. It energizes them. It gives them a sense of confidence. It makes people work more because they want to improve their lives. I dare say 99% of us in this room, if we had a basic, basic income that gave you one third of the median income of Sweden, I would dare to guess that none of you would stop working. It's the fact that we work to develop our capabilities to improve our lives from where we are starting from. And having basic security enables people to have more confidence, to be able to deal with short-term contingencies, to feel greater control over their lives, and therefore participate as equal citizens with some sense of dignity. If it leads, as it has done in those villages, to a shift of type of work, so be it. What we found, in fact, is a huge increase in women's work in those villages, but it was women's work as a secondary own account type of activity. Because they suddenly had a sense of control, a sense of access to liquidity, in which they could actually do something and do their own work. So if you just took main activity, there was hardly any change, men and women. But it was secondary activities that the people were developing, rearing animals, producing clothes, providing services, you know, all sorts of secondary activities. And that, I think, is the human condition. We all want to better ourselves, and we become more productive. Psychological research has shown that, that we become far more productive. But also, think of those five assets I was talking about, or the assets that are unequally distributed. If you have basic security, you have a basic control of time. You feel better, you feel you can make decisions. 
If I do less work going down a sewage and more work cultivating my allotment, is that bad? You know, I may not get any income from this activity over here, but I can actually say to an employer, well, if you don't pay me the wage I want, I'm going off to do something else. And that puts pressure, upward pressure, on paying people decently or automating jobs that should be automated. On what used to be a park, we can all slow down. We can read more, have more sex, have whatever it is that turns you on. That is good. Because it creates a more balanced atmosphere and a capability that you are controlling part of your development in a greater way. And that is one of the really strong arguments for moving towards basic income. Let me briefly deal with the objections. The objection on labor supply I've already dealt with. The other one is affordability. Big objection, we can't afford a basic income. We're a very rich society, but we can't afford a basic income. This is nonsense. At the moment, every country, including Sweden, gives away more than 5% of its national income in subsidies to the wealthy. Right? You can document it, you can show it in various ways. Huge subsidies that are given to wealthy corporations, wealthy individuals. They are regressive, they are distortionary from an economic point of view, and they often are ecologically destructive rather than ecologically preserving. But they're still given away because of the powers that be. So we need, and call, I've called one of the articles, we need a bonfire of subsidies. Bonfire of subsidies and replacing subsidies with actually providing a basic income where people can start being in control of their lives. But the affordability argument can also be met by saying, look, we need mechanisms to get control of that rental income that is growing up here. And that is why every country needs a capital fund, a sovereign wealth capital fund. When I first came to Sweden, Rudolf Meigner, who became a good friend, had been working on his wage earner funds, which was a form of capital fund. He was very disillusioned and disappointed because the LO had deserted the idea along with the employers and he realized that that was a big defeat for a progressive future. But we know that Norway has its wonderful fund. We know that Alaska has a permanent fund which provides every citizen of Alaska with what's the basic income in effect. And a number of other countries have created sovereign wealth funds. Every country should have a sovereign wealth fund by which you can not only capitalize, but make sure that you don't lose all your income going outside your society and making sure there is public pressure on making sure the investments are sustainable and yield an income just like the Alaska Fund that can be paid out to all citizens. And that should be democratically controlled. The affordability argument is disingenuous, just as the claim by the middle class that it will make people lazy is disingenuous. Now, the last thing I want to say is that a basic income, I believe, should have three components. It should have a fixed amount, which is set at a modest level to give people enough security that in extremists they can survive. It should on top of that have a what I call an economic stabilization component, which when the economy is booming and you've got nearly full employment or whatever, high aggregate demand, the central committee could cut the amount. And when they're tending towards recession, it could be raised, so it could be an automatic stabilizer, just as social insurance used to play that role. And the third component is should that every person with special needs, be it a disability, or mental, physical, or a frailty, or some life cycle stage, there would be extra supplements for those needs, based on needs, not behavior. Now, it's essential that in setting up a basic income, there should be an independent committee 
that is legitimized outside government control. Because otherwise you would have populist reactions just before an election. Let's raise the basic income and everybody will feel satisfied with the government. So you have to have a, a, an independent basic income uh, committee for doing it. Now you can meet all these objections. There are others and the arguments for and against I've put in the book. But what I think is most important today in 2014 is there is a renewed energy, a renewed sense that this is feasible, desirable, and why not? And it reminded me, and I wrote to all our members on our 25th anniversary, we have an international network, and those of you who are not involved, please join BIAN, as well as the Basic Income uh, Gothenburg Network, that something that Milton Friedman said many, many years ago, when he was in the political exile stage of life, and he said, our job is to promote the ideas when they are seen to be impossible, until such time as they seem not just possible, but inevitable. And he lived long enough to see himself gone, going from being regarded as a nutcase to be receiving a Nobel Prize. None of us should aspire to this, but he realizes that ideas take time to, to change. And they go from being regarded as mad, bad, and dangerous to suddenly, well, wait, 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 let's think about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's going to take a new generation of political activists with the courage and the ability to face down the skeptics on television interviews or wherever and say, yeah, 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 I do believe in giving people money, yeah. And what do you do? You know, instead of being put on the defensive, feeling that the actual fact, yes, 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 and what do you have to say? Let's discuss. We are moving very fast to that stage. And I think that's great. And on that note, thank you very much for listening. Thank you.